You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This season of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is presented to you by the Sketchnote Handbook's 10th birthday. And we're giving you the gifts. Save 50% when you buy any two of the Sketchnote Handbook, the Sketchnote Workbook, or the Sketchnote Handbook video together as a set. Offer applies to both the print and ebook editions of the books. Use discount code HAPPY10 at checkout to apply savings. That's HAPPY10. This set of books makes a great gift for new sketchnoters or the perfect way to replace your lent out copies of the books that haven't been returned. And if you own a physical copy of the Sketchnote Handbook and would love to have a digital copy, you can get the ebook and the video for your iPad. For details on this offer, visit roadesign.com slash happy10. That's roadesign.com slash happy10. Offer ends December 31st, 2022, so buy yours today. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, this is Mike Rohde and I'm here with Jude Pullen. Jude, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Hey, it's great to be there. Thanks so much, Mike. We've crossed paths a couple of years ago. You invited me on your podcast and we had a really fun discussion. And then I started <laughs> digging into it, like, who's this Jude Pullen guy? And you're, you've been on TV and you're into like making things, but you're also like a huge fan of sketchnoting and visualization and drawing. And I just felt like it would be a great opportunity to bring you on. And I think you sort of have a really interesting crossover with making things and visualization that I thought was really fascinating. So now I'm going to stop talking and ask you, Jude, tell us who you are and what you do. Well, I guess what I'd say is uh, I'm a creative technologist. Um, I've called myself a product designer uh, Mm -hmm. before that, and we can maybe get into like why that's evolved later. Um, But I guess in, in case you're wondering what this newfangled term means, I tend to describe it to people as saying, I look for cutting edge technology and try to make it simple, or Mm. I look for simple technology that's been around for ages and is really, you know, cost effective and well integrated in industrial processes. But then I try to give it a fresh twist. So Mm. people think, wow, never expected them to do that with that old thing that I thought I had seen it all done before. So it's uh, it's a little bit of sort of old dog, new tricks type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I work for everything from startups, independents to uh, Fortune 100 companies mm. um, and really enjoy sort of basically testing myself on a uh, almost project by project basis, trying to do something mm. that scares me, as they say, um, <laughs> which, which I'm, I'm definitely living up to that. <laughs> That, that ambition so it's That's it's a wonderful. lot of fun but it's hair raising no pun intended great <laughs> and so you were uh, i take it then you're an independent and then you sort of con you sort of contract or work with companies or projects of your own i guess you decide i want to learn how to make this or that or use this technology and then you would just pursue that yeah, so I, I'm I'm sitting in my shed now. For those of people on audio, uh, that it actually looks bigger than it is. It's basically like I can lie down <laughs> in two <laughs> directions. It's like two meter cube shed. Um, but but honestly, it's you know I've got two 3D printers in here. I've got a mm. second monitor, um, a bunch of different materials and things which I can sort of make things. Often I sort of describe what I'm really doing is is thinking with my hands. So it's saying I've got an idea in my head and a bit like yourself with sketch noting, how do you get it onto paper? And then I transfer that into physical form is kind mm. of my uh, extension on that journey, I guess you could mm. say. Mm. I think you would probably be, my, my nine-year-old son would be probably your biggest fan because he's a lot like you kind of mentioned before we started like if we try to throw boxes away and it looks interesting to him he'll grab that box and turn it into i don't know whatever like he's always repurposing things so you would probably love uh the work that he does and maybe we can talk a little bit about that during the discussion i'd love to yeah but first i would love to hear how did you end up in this place where you're doing creative you're you're a creative technologist and you're making things and and exploring how did you end up here i assume that you didn't just start out you know, from this place, but you probably moved to this place over time. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of those things, you know, where they, they sort of say like, oh, jobs that don't fully exist yet, or <laughs> just starting out. I feel creative technologist is one of those, but I guess to, um, 
to go back in time, I, I try to sort of reassure people that, uh, you know, you do sometimes get a second chance. But I, I think uh, I was lucky that I, I started off doing a chemistry degree. I sort of felt that this was very much a reaction to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to sort of overplay that, my you know, I came from poverty or anything, but my parents were <laughs> quite sort of, uh, you know, sort of at times, you know, small startup businesses are pretty tough. And so I definitely felt the uh, pressure of money, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, growing up. And I felt that um, even though I was really passionate about art, the fact that I could do science as well, my careers advisor was like, well, if you're gifted enough to do science, don't mess around with that arty stuff and mm -hmm. go get yourself a good wage. So I, I think I sort of felt like, yeah, okay, maybe you're right. And uh, so I went ahead and did chemistry. I did okay in it. Um, but I really felt, you know, creatively, it was just really devoid of any satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had a really sort of terrible year after that um, of, you know, I should say it wasn't terrible in the jobs I did. It was terrible that I didn't know what I was doing, but mm -hmm. the, the people in the jobs were lovely. Uh, but I worked in a, in a butcher's. Uh, then I worked in a statistical uh, office for the council um, and then a horticultural specialist. And I think at that point... Um, weirdly, we can maybe get back to it. The horticultural specialist was, was still to this day one of the most technologically insane places I've ever worked. Mm. Um, but that after seeing um, uh, Better by Design, Seymour on Powell, uh, Channel 4 series in the UK, I kind of thought, oh my gosh, that that's what designers do. And I had thought it was just all about sketching. Mm. And it isn't. It's about sketching and building and user mm. and da 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 da. Uh, so I decided to go back to Glasgow School of Art and retrain in product design engineering. Mm. Um, and honestly, my world went from being very small to traveling all around the world, um, studying in a load of different countries, and honestly, just having a huge amount of fun. Um, I then worked at, at Dyson um, and then got headhunted by uh, Sugru, a startup that makes a sort of mm -hmm. squishy moldable glue. Um, then ended up moving to Lego to be a tech scout. And I would say that that was almost the, 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 the formative years that almost taught me how to become independent mm -hmm. um, and be able to sort of work as a creative technologist as essentially that's what I was doing at Lego. But I mm -hmm. realized that there's so much joy in also doing things that are playful for completely different industries that aren't usually associated with play. Um, mm. So that's where I found myself now. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's really, that's really fascinating. And, you know, I, I think you had a, did you have a show in the UK that you did for a period of time? Maybe you still do. Yeah, no, that, that was kind of crazy in that um, I was working at, Sugru just had a baby and was stupid enough to say yes to, uh, oh yeah, and Moving House as well, uh, to say yes to doing a TV show called Big Life Fix, um, which I think is often described as uh, helping people with various disabilities mm -hmm. through clever use of modern technologies. Um, and so that was that was basically an incredible experience. And, it, you know, I wasn't skipping over it. It's that I almost consider it, you know, a, above my day-to-day uh, -day work mm -hmm. in that it was really something that was just a highlight personally as well as professionally. Mm. I think the reason I bring that up is because for me, it sort of encapsulates you. Like we we sort of, we crossed paths, you invited me on the show, I did this interview, we had a lot of fun. And then I yeah. started digging around and like, holy cow, and then I found the show and it's like, oh yeah, that's Jude, but look what he's doing. And <laughs> we, I just watched all the shows and it just really captured kind of the essence of sort of what you do, right? Like now it was a very, sp it was a very specific task that you were trying to achieve, but still all the components that you're talking about, sort of the hacking and yeah. working things out, were all in there, I think. Yeah. And I, I absolutely love that uh, because it was really that thing of, um, I later did a TEDx talk on, on essentially the sort of notion that I had sort of come to this realization that if I get a brief and I look at it and I read it and I go, ah, oh, you know what? Great, I can do all of that. It it's almost like intellectually dead for me by mm. the time I finished with it. That doesn't mean I didn't earn good money. That doesn't mean that the people weren't wonderful to work with. But in terms of like pushing my creativity, it mm. doesn't take me anywhere. Whereas Big Life Fix, there was I would say, you know, as a rule of thumb, there was about fifty percent where we all looked at it 
and thought, yeah, I think I could probably make some headway with that. And then there was 50%, which was just, I won't speak for everyone there, but certainly my experience was at least that completely unknown. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't mean a Google away. I didn't know it. I mean, really, there was not solutions for these problems, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. sitting around waiting to sort of be, uh, you know, reconfigured that I borrowed from uh, seeing something on the, on the internet. So that that was the the personal, professional, mm. and uh, I'm not religious, but I would say there was a degree of, there was a sort of real sense of understanding purpose and a calling. Mm. Uh, there was something quite profound that affected me, which is why whenever I speak about working with, you know, all the people on the show, as well as the, uh, the team that was uh, developing these things together, it, it really truly changed my life you know to have mm. worked on something like that so i yeah i extremely grateful for the opportunity wow that's really that's a really good endorsement for the show so if you're listening put that on your list and go check it out i, I assume that we could probably find the some of the episodes on youtube or something like that I, in some place i would uh i would i would love to say that uh <laughs> pbc had made it but it has very complicated licensing laws i think if you uh, have like yeah. britbox you can check okay. it out or whatever possibly but um uh, yeah i'm not gonna lie there's some bootleg copies out there for sure yeah on youtube <laughs> somehow i found one or two or at least snippets or something i and i really thought it was fun so if you're in, into if you're interested that would be something to uh mark down and check in the show notes we'll dig, we'll see if we can dig up some samples yeah, so you get a sense of it yeah interesting like the parallel you talk about sort of being pushed i felt like when I wrote the sketchnote handbook, I felt a little that way. Like fifty percent of it, I felt pretty confident about. I was a graphic designer. I did mm. production design. I knew how to sketch. I was an illustrator. So all those things I kind of knew about. The part that was the fifty percent I didn't know was like, okay, we made this book now. How do we convince people <laughs> that they need it? <laughs> right. That was like totally. And I had done guerrilla type marketing type stuff before, but never for a book. And we, we, you know, it was we were really forced to be creative with what we did like getting on podcasts which happened to peak at the time and we gave away tons and tons of review copies which was sort of an interesting angle i don't know if that was being pursued at the time so Mm. that was really like and so the other thing too was we i kind of knew about the book part the other part i didn't mention was the the handbook came with a video uh, companion which a lot of people don't know and it's in the back in this little we they, they just passed cds or dvds uh, so it didn't come on a disc. It just it was a code and you had to go log it. And it, like all these friction points that made it really difficult. And a lot of people don't know existed. But I had never, I didn't shoot a video before. I've never been on camera like that. I mean, I'd done some speaking. And so that was like a whole new space. Now, fortunately, I had a friend who'd done a lot of that and he guided me. But it was mm. totally new space. And I feel like the same way, like being pushed in that way where some portion of it I felt pretty good about. And then there was a, a lot of it that I didn't know anything about and had no you know, no benchmarks for what's good or bad. I kept asking my editor, is that, a, is that good? And she's like, yeah, that's really good. You know, so I, I can kind of connect with you in that, that it was really fun and sort of a, a, a strong moment where I felt, hey, there's purpose in this as well. So I can relate to that a little mm-hmm. bit. Absolutely. So you're doing this uh, creative technologist work. What What's something that you're, kind of excited about right now that you might want to chat about that you're able to talk about does does it have to be related to sketches no or, not at all. Uh, okay not at all. uh I, I guess the thing that you know for some people who've probably seen my stuff they'll they'll skip over this bit but i've been working on this little thing which is uh essentially an, a series of air quality sensors ah. so the reason i was holding on to it gingerly there um we can put links in below for this but but essentially what i'm showing people is like a series of lego bricks which mm. click together and they have little sensors on top of them. Mm. And then there's a little black screen because it's switched off at the minute, but that would display the air quality readings. Mm. Um, and basically, this is this is kind of what I love about my work in that I'm working with um, uh, RS Components and Design Spark to basically help connect me with amazing people uh, like AB Open who have basically done all the, 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 the sort of hardware and software 
but I enjoy coming up with the concept of like mm. how these things would be. And so what what I learned from that, um, and it's a bit of a running theme, um, is that I thought, well, okay, that's great for engineers because it's a big engineering community that's looking at it. But this little canary, and uh, again, for anyone listening, <laughs> I'm holding this uh, automata looking 3D printed canary. Um, and what happens is, is it's got a little screen next to it and it's an Internet of Things device that links to those sensors. And when it gets to an unfavorable level, it basically falls off the perch in the canary in the coal mine metaphor. Yes. <laughs> um, so the reason I mention that isn't to sort of get lost in the weeds of the technology for your audience, but it's it's really that I love that it, it does go through that refinement of what is the story, which I know is something you're, you know, very close to your heart. And and I realized that there's this interesting duality between the people who are really techie join at the sensor level, but then go, oh, actually, that's really quite a nice little pun. I like what you did there. Very clever, very good. And, and then there's people who really would never access the sensor stuff independently, mm. but they're intrigued by this, you know, seemingly detailed uh, 3D printed canary and think, what's it all about? And they dig yeah. into these. Uh, and that's when we can talk about the statistics like, you know, it, it's basically about 7 million deaths a year are caused by mm. good, uh, sorry, uh, by, by bad uh, air quality. And that's ranging from indoor and outdoor, which is approximately 50-50 split. And, and often when I say these numbers to people, they're just blown away that they think, yeah. Oh well, I had heard about you know heart disease and, and and things like road accidents and you know especially sort of road accidents. That's sort of like about uh, not to di not to diminish the number, but it's not a contest, but it's it's about like one point three million per year. And so the the preoccupation in our minds over things which we think are high risk, and then actually I, I sort of feel like air quality is this silent killer, um, mm. and it's because it doesn't have this you know, huge, quite literally impact in our lives in an instant that it sort of goes on in the background. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess this is also like why why heart disease is is so difficult as well, because it's that it's that drip, 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 you know, mm -hmm. uh, that is the problem. I think because we live such long lives, we, we're now having to grapple with the notion that you know, we've got to take care of the machine, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you, yeah. most of us should be living past 80. Um, you know, and, and so it's sort of realizing these things will actually have a cumulative effect. So um, I feel that the reason I sort of have really enjoyed projects like this is, is that it started off as a seed of things that I've been working on, but has then expanded to all these other people who've then taken the project and run with it in their own directions. Um, and that for me is just, I, I, I don't intend to become a school teacher, but I still... <laughs> I still love transference of knowledge like yourself, you know, just yeah. just because I think I would be and it's not because I'm down on teachers. I think I would just get fired from being <laughs> I, I would I would be like the worst teacher ever because I just wouldn't abide by the rules of the curriculum. And I know yeah. that 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 isn't how the world works. But but I love I love feeling if I can learn something and then give it back. Um, mm. I always feel I get, you know, 10 times more back so it's almost like a a, a non-intentional karma you know mm. of these things you, you you often learn a lot through that pushing yourself to explain it simply as well mm. mm -hmm. it's almost like you're carrying a torch and you're lighting the torches up for these other people who either want them lit or didn't realize and suddenly they're excited and you see the fire going in all directions right in that sense yeah you think of a metaphor and, and that's the crazy thing right is that i i genuinely grew up in rural Cumbria and didn't even think a designer was a legitimate profession that I could mm. pursue. And then I saw TV and that's, that's kind of why for me, it was kind of, uh, quite poetic to come back and actually do a TV show where mm. now I've been around long enough to know that actually there's young people who consider design as a, as a mm -hmm. career because they saw, saw that show. So it's, it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy that I sort of realize there is that circularity mm. to it. So mm. as much as I know TV is often, you know, the the idiot box or whatever it was called in the 1950s, I, I think it's great when, um, you know, one of the reviewers on The Telegraph said a good example of TV making itself useful. So mm. it, it's great when you feel there's something of substance in your work, not just always mm -hmm. sweating about paying the bills. Right. Yeah. It, 
it feels to me like all these media too have good sides and bad sides. It's not one or the other, right? So there's certainly bad stuff about TV that isn't great for us. But then there's yeah. inspiring things that I know my wife learned how to knit on YouTube, right? So my son learned how to play the guitar on YouTube, right? Yeah. So it can be, it, it is there. I know I've learned a lot on YouTube. I can't point to anything specific, but it's a great resource. And it also is a, you know, you can fall down a hole and spend it's, hours doing dumb things too, right? So you have to check yourself, but... It's how you want to use it, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. So I'm kind of curious, you know, coming in from the sketching angle, and we can talk, this maybe we could talk a little bit about this, how that fits in sure. your process, is um, on that particular project, the air quality um, meter, um, yeah. or sensor, I guess, is actually better. And then, you know, the, the meter, I guess, is the bird, the canary, which, you know will die if the if the if the the air quality is bad enough um which i i suspect so is the concept that the fil- that the sensors are outside or maybe outside and inside and yeah. then someone in a house would look at the bird and if it's like leaning maybe you stay home that day or well that's it and it also has a little audio prompt as well so i've switched Mm. it off for the purposes of this interview because it might get a bit annoying but (laughs) but basically it it goes through like five stages of distress uh Mm. in the audio file and also its posture um but but yeah to your point about sort of process i i dug out a sketchbook quickly for this and and that was like a really early um iteration of it in the end it didn't it didn't end up being uh, how it turned out um, mm-hmm. for anyone on audio it's basically a, a, a pretty rough and ready sketch of a little bird and I was looking mm-hmm. at how to make the wings flap um, and then even just sort of a lot of quite mundane things where I'm just mm-hmm. communicating with other people in the team and going mm-hmm. hey so I'm thinking of this screen and this size uh, you know do you think this would be a good good way to sort of harmonize it should we have the buttons on the side or on the top mm-hmm. Um, so I use sketching in a very uh, just just sort of get the job done way. Mm-hmm. And then um, strangely with some of the new sensors at the minute, um, I'm currently building a radiation sensor. And again, mm-hmm. just saying, you know, hang on a minute. Should we be doing this? Should we have a grill on it? Uh, what if we sort of like recess it and mm-hmm. all these sorts of questions? So mm-hmm. I appreciate, again, for those listening, I can maybe put some links to it. But but really, I, I use it... Um, sketching very much as a way to bring a team together that's multidisciplinary. Um, I think sometimes when you're just on Slack or you're on an email, there's there's a huge amount of stuff that can just get lost in the wash or, or completely mm-hmm. turned upside down in someone else's head or mine as well. Um, strangely, I, I don't know whether this is a useful uh, sort of segue that uh, I've just I've just bought this book, uh, Design Sketches, oh. um, by Luki... Huber, uh, or Uber, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, forgive me. Um, but basically, he, he worked as the product designer at the internationally famous El Bulli uh, mm. Kitchens. Um, and, and essentially, what I love about his book, and I can put a link in the bottom, is just, again, it, it's reassuring. His sketches are good, <laughs> but but they're not what you'd call rock star sketches. Yeah. And I love functional. that. And for, mm-hmm. They're functional sketches. And I, I love the fact that there's a real honesty in them and mm-hmm. and for me that just massively like draws me in because I love seeing you know I, I've worked a lot alongside some real rock star sketches and I know the difference when someone's gone yeah I re- redrew that again for folio and then <laughs> and it just loses some of that like you know coffee stained intensity you know should we say yeah uh, life I think it's yeah. life yeah Exactly. So I, 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 you know, I mean, who knows, maybe uh, he actually redrew all of them, but they, they have an honest, uh, explosive quality to them, which I really mm-hmm. like. And um, for me, as you can see behind me, the uh, the whiteboard, which has now become somewhat of an <laughs> icon, because I realized shortly after doing that, that the, I can't put confidential work on the back. So it became yeah. <laughs> a very expensive piece of paper, essentially. Um <laughs> But but nonetheless, I, I sort of feel that that's what I also loved. Uh, and I should say for anyone watching this, I don't consider myself a good sketcher. I've got mm-hmm. better over the years. But actually, mm-hmm. when, when we first, uh, our paths first collided, I think I was at uh, Sugru, and that was predominantly a chemistry gig. Mm-hmm. And I wanted my team of uh, material scientists and chemists to create better journals and mm-hmm. communicate better graphically. Um, and so your book was, I bought it for the whole team, 
Um, and it really just helped people see that you don't have to be an artist to be able mm -hmm. to give something a visual form um, and communicate with each other. So I, I sort of felt that actually, you know, having things like, like that where you realize there isn't this high-end fine art level that you have to achieve, there's this gritty get it done <laughs> level yeah. which is acceptable that that for me was um you know incredibly helpful that i understood that early mm. well that's really great i'm glad that it helped your team and um that's been sort of my driving force in all the work i do is whenever i teach is having people you know realize that there's a really low threshold that is acceptable that lets mm. you you know get started and you don't have to look like michelangelo or some amazing artists you just have to communicate the ideas and that's yeah that's always a lot of fun um I, i'm not trying to turn this into a book review uh, but i did bring along <laughs> a couple of things here um, let's talk about I, them i'm sure you've i'm sure you've mentioned um scott mcleod right yeah understanding yeah. comics oh yeah um again for anyone who who doesn't know this uh there's basically a sort of a pretty famous pyramid that he draws uh, which essentially articulates the the difference between sort of uh, essentially realism, uh, the, mm. the sort of the picture and and meaning. Um, and I'm not going to sort of try and describe this too too badly, but essentially, it was a real sort of epiphany for me of where he sort of pointed out that when you draw a little stick man with just just the simplest two dots and a smiley face, just this notion that he said the reason this is you know, sort of omnipresent and ubiquitous almost, is because when you strip out all that detail, we actually pour ourselves into it. Yes, yeah. And, and for me, that was like a... The more I thought about it, the more it was like, oh my God, this is huge. This is this is a really important thing to understand about humans, ego, empathy, uh, communication. Mm -hmm. And so, so that actually really sort of got me hooked onto this understanding of like actually the the importance of just enough that people could engage and so weirdly mm. that that actually influenced a lot my prototyping style by realizing mm. the the word sketch you use that in a pen to paper way but i use sketch in a sketch modeling mm -hmm. way um which is to mean that i want someone to actually not feel intimidated by cardboard and actually, I'd say sometimes when you 3D print stuff and you spray paint it and you make it look really cool, you actually get really bad user feedback because everybody thinks mm -hmm. it looks too polished. I can't criticize it. Um, whereas when you sort of, you know, give them this glue gun, you know, mask and tape together bit of cardboard, they're more than happy to just get a craft knife and chop a bit off it <laughs> or like get a lump of pl plasticine or Play-Doh and... and bosh it on top and smooth it out and say, yeah, that that's what I'd rather have. That's going to be much mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I felt that strangely, you know, people like Scott really helped me understand mm. the sort of the, the power of creating a, a level playing field where everybody mm. can say, I understand that we can all move forward. And I'd say at the highest levels of cutting edge technology that I've worked on, that, that step can't be avoided. Mm -hmm. You know, you it's it's kind of like ignore that at your peril. Yeah. If if you realize, you know, six weeks, you know, six months into a project, you just left someone behind who doesn't really understand what you're doing. That that's the that's that's Huge. the difference between promotion, funding, the project going through, and you go, Yeah, you should have should have made it simple. <laughs> mm, yeah. 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 That's really interesting. The thing that you talk about, you know, having these like a cardboard with glue gun and like it's sort of hacked together it sort of has a feel and a look to it a lot like the sketches that you said in that book and i feel mm. the same way too so when i i don't do lots of logo and icon design these days once in a while for a friend but i that was my bread and butter for many years in the mid 2000s and i felt it was really important to not jump too quickly there were agencies at the time that sort of had this idea like well we'll take all your information in the brief and then we'll show you this amazing logo and you like you don't even get to pick anything you just get what yeah. we think is best for you right and i just sort of revolted against that i guess and went in a different direction because the companies i was working with were small businesses that were running mm. you know SaaS software tools and you know I was operating as their secret weapon but i felt like we were a lot more like partners and partners mm. talk to each other and they communicate and get feedback and you can't just 
kind of do a one-way steamroller over what they're thinking or their feedback. So I would do these sketches and I would keep them intentionally loose. I would share every sketch that I made. I would number all the sketches and then in my in my descriptions, I would try to describe what my thinking was as I was doing that idea. And mm. I would even include the ones that I thought were terrible. Like, this is a terrible idea. And here's why it's terrible. Like, I had to go down, but yeah. I had to go down that path to find out that it was terrible. And here's why. But mm. that see that little corner over there? That was really interesting. So then I did number seven, and that one is kind of interesting. And, you know, so you would sort of show the whole story of the process. And that, that really helped. And I think I've always had this belief that by not um, amplifying things too quickly, like mm. when I did logo design, I would include would not include color intentionally because color is a real, you know, um, trigger. Hugely. It'll get people to say yes or no or have opinions about things that has nothing to do with the design, right? So I left that all out. I had to work in black and white. My argument was the old uh, stuff... I'd need to be able to fax it to someone it should hold up, right? That was my that was my yardstick. If I could fax it and it could make it through a fax maybe twice, <laughs> then we were in yeah. good shape, right? Then we could go to color. So I think there is sort of like a, a universal something related to that that's sort of when you reach a threshold, I don't know where that threshold is, that if you get too too clean and perfect, you kinda you sort of limit people's ability to give feedback or feel like they have a right to be part of this partnership. Mm. And if you kind of lean back on the other side of that threshold that you do a lot, you get people to, to discuss and, and integrate. So that's really interesting to hear that same idea in your business. That's in my business. And I had thought about that for many, many years. So it's actually really encouraging for me to hear that. Yeah. And it, it, I think what I love is also, um, you know, sort of the, the um the sort of nature of of habit and 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 sort of one of the things I really picked up from yours was just the the sort of encouragement just to say keep doing little doodles just keep mm -hmm. taking a moment and pausing and thinking could I could I just make a little icon of this mm -hmm. um and so yeah I guess the the other sort of big influences um I'm sure you're very familiar with Christoph Nyman. Yes. Um, for yeah. anyone who doesn't know, basically just, I don't want to demean him by saying sort of visual puns, but but just the way he sort of is playful with the yeah. the combination of the visual imagery as well as the, uh, the, 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 the way that a word manifests in our, in our sort of creativity or our, our culture. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, again, I don't know whether this is recording, but <laughs> it's, it's, you know, he has a sort of picture of like a ginkgo leaf, which he's sort of chopped into a Wi-Fi signal. Yeah. And and this only makes sense when you sort of go on this journey of the, again, I think it's a little bit American centric of like a leaf collection which is often done in, in sort of schools. And yeah. then you have to collect yeah. all the different leaves and name them. And so he's sort of taken that to a sort of artistic sort of whimsical <laughs> level of yeah. making up sort of a, a t-shirt, tree shirt, because it's cut in the shape of a t mm -hmm. uh, t-shirt. But I, I love the fact that, I mean, it's amazing that he, he gets the work he does by doing this. Uh, and I, I met Noma Barr at uh, Beyond Teleran, who I'd say is a, you know, a peer and, and has sort of equal pedigree in these things. But then I love... Um, a uh, friend of mine, Tim King, who did a book called mm. Drawn on Real Life, which I think I've mentioned to you as well, um, mm. and something called reportage illustration, mm. which means capturing the the essence of a moment, sometimes in dialogue, but also sometimes on a thing that mm. is connected to what you're trying to depict. So he's sometimes drawing coffee culture on mm. a coffee cup mm -hmm. uh, to sort of like double down on the... Uh, the meaning of that and the reason I sort of brought these books along was just I felt they were just such a nice way to sort of stay creatively fresh and it's something that inspired mm -hmm. me to keep Instagram going even though I the algorithm hates me um, <laughs> the irony is whenever I send my Instagram feed to, to clients they're just like oh my god this is amazing this is really shows that you just have this continual sustained effort on, on putting out all these ideas. So even though, yeah, as I said, the, and I say that quite deliberately that the algorithm isn't loving me because I, I've just had this discussion with someone who's a few years my junior and I'm just saying, look, but I, I never actually was trying to be a Instagram famous. Mm -hmm. 
I was doing it out of a little bit uh, inspiration from your sort of thing of just going, make it part of your life and it'll start to give back to you. And I, I, I really took that to heart. Um, I don't remember that, whether those were your exact words, but that's how I internalized it mm-hmm. of, of just saying, if I can just make it part of a ritual that I just stay creative, keep drawing, just don't worry about who's looking over my shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I felt that it's really brought a lot of fluidity and insight to my work. Mm. Um, and, and that's why, yeah, that's why it's a pleasure to be here as well. <laughs> mm. That's really great to hear. It's so often you sort of do these things and you wonder, you know, is anybody noticing? And a lot of times, maybe the best you get is a like, a little heart on Instagram, but you, you don't know the other side of it where maybe it's changed their life. And I've run into definitely people who say that the, the concepts that I just did because it worked for me and knew that it would help other people has really yeah. helped them. That's really encouraging to hear because you often don't hear the, you know, the full circle. It's really fun to hear the full circle. Like you've heard yeah. about your show, right? Where you did the show and, you know, you had a lot of fun, but now it's got this second follow on uh, impact on other people bringing students who might not have gone into the space to be interested in go- and follow you and to explore what does it mean for them, right? It may not be exactly you, what you do, but it might be mm. their own angle on it, which is what the world needs, right? So, so you talk a lot about um, development um, and you've shown some sketches, you've shown some finished pieces. Can you give us a shorthand of like what your process normally looks like? Does it begin with sketches? Does it begin with discussions? Does it vary all the time based on the project itself? Yeah, I, I mean, I remember sort of when I got your invite, I was sort of like, oh, maybe I feel like a bit of a charlatan because I don't <laughs> start with sketches, um, which is the assumed place to start, certainly in product design. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think actually the, the honest truth, and I guess I, I know we're among friends, so it's kind of good to be open about these things. But actually, you know, contrary to what my education was, um, I tend to start with models or mm. taking things apart and, and just getting to sort of have a tacit understanding of things. Mm-hmm. And then what I find often is that the idea becomes complex to the point where actually partitioning off individual problems and then sketching them down mm. to, re- to, to, to almost hold them in place (laughs) so there isn't quite as much mental load and then it means i can sort of revisit each of them and do almost like an attack on them so Mm. so it's quite it's quite possible that say with the air quality thing there's probably about 50 things which i had sort of you know double diamonded and expanded it and then you kind of need to sift through them so i find that sketching is a good is a good filter for me Mm. um also it's it's i guess it's a little bit like being your own editor you you sort of look at things in a slightly uh, dispassionate way, um, which is, yeah, there's a fine line between dispassionate and, you know, self-critical and negative. And I mm. think that that's a journey, right? <laughs> we, mm-hmm. all, yeah. we all go on is saying, am I dismissing this idea because I'm insecure or there's something here? Or am I dismissing it because I've really looked at it objectively and I've, mm. I've made an informed choice? So assuming I'm doing, you know, the better of those two, that that's often why I use the the sketching, and then as I said, I move to increasing levels of sophistication of the prototype whilst continually engaging people. But often, as mm-hmm. as I said, like just being able to do a quick sketch in my book, take a picture on WhatsApp or whatever, and fire it across to someone and be like, "Do you mean like this?" Before I spend a day in CAD, yeah, is this okay? And actually, I was really <laughs> glad that I got one back of like, "Uh, no, no, it can't have that," and I'm like. Well, I'm glad I just doodled it in as a mm-hmm. an assumption, and my assumption was way out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But but they hadn't explicitly said don't ever do this. It's just I put it in there as a well, it's not a bad idea. But instead, I had to design around it. So so I think um, yeah, a sketch can really uh, save a lot of pain. <laughs> mm. Is the honest truth. <laughs> I kind I like the way that you approach it, and you said you you know you almost look at like maybe prototypes with sugu or cardboard or whatever elements you're working with can be a sketch too, right? It's almost like yeah. you're taking you're, you're going beyond just ink on a page and you're actually physically manipulating the object. Because in your case, especially, it's going to end up as a physical object, most likely, right? It's something that will exist in the world. Where for, yeah. for me, like I'm doing illustrations for a book, let's say, its final destination is to be an illustration in a book, right? It's not going to become a physical object. 
so it has a different purpose. But I love that. Um, did you honor? It sounded like no. I, I was just going to add something which might be interesting mm-hmm. to you that um, most people see me as a physical creator, but mm-hmm. actually, strangely, probably about sixty percent of my income is derived from stuff that people don't see and is very ah. conceptual. So, so weirdly, actually, my getting into storyboarding has mm-hmm. been incredibly relevant. So mm-hmm. again, this is something which that's why I've got people like Kevin McLeod, sorry Scott McLeod, because there's the mm-hmm. I've almost mashed up in my head the the sort of the teachings of Scott with your speed, and so I I don't draw a comic strip in the same mm-hmm. way a an illustrator would. Yeah. But I, I often, you know, when I'm speaking to a video editor who I've just been working with, I drew out the storyboards in probably about 10 minutes. Um, but, it, but it explains the rhythm, the pacing, all of this sort of stuff, the, the affinity with the music. Mm-hmm. Um, and so things like that. And then when moving towards concept, you're trying to explain something, as I said, that often is in the vanguard. And so it doesn't have a, an easy visual signature. Mm-hmm. So actually, this is where you go, well, well how, do I, how do I give an icon? I mean, most people, if you say draw a smartphone, they'll draw a rectangle with another rectangle mm-hmm. and sign a little dot, even though the thumbprint mm-hmm. is missing, we still do it like cameras. Mm-hmm. But, but weirdly, I've sort of thought, actually, it's quite exciting when I force myself to go, this doesn't exist. I've now got to create an icon for it. Because I need to, I need to create my own comic strip, and we need this common language mm-hmm. between myself and the team to to do these sorts of projects. So, so I would say um, one of the most powerful things I've realized is that you you kind of become your own storyboarder mm. it, it, working in technology. Mm-hmm. You, you know, which which isn't something I would have thought I would be doing if you'd asked me five years ago. Interesting. Let's Sorry, that was like a bit you, of a tangent. <laughs> no, that's really that's really on on track too. And the thing I think overall I love about this discussion is that you're super practical in adapting and fitting things in where they make sense or where necessary. So, like you talked about, we're talking about this project. I know we're going to do some uh, some CAD work. So I take ten minutes and I sketch out this concept and I WhatsApp it to the person and I say, "No, that's terrible." That's wrong, or don't do that, right? And it now gives you the direction to redo it. So you're sort of fitting in sketching or sketch mm-hmm. noting or whatever you want to call it where it makes sense, which is kind of my belief is like, you know, fit it in where you need to. If it's just a little doodle on a page, I do that a lot of times in my little notebook. I'll I'll need to, like I'm doing an icon. I'll just do a little scribble of like, well, what, what does the icon look like now? What can we do with mm-hmm. it? And I'll just doodle around. And then that gives me a little bit of a step back before I go into say Adobe Illustrator or something to build the final piece. And I'll sort of work out the problems on the page. And it might actually be what's working in my head. It's just the page is what, what reflects my thinking. But it can fit in any place, like working with developers and doing software, trying to draw like what it is that we're trying to achieve and someone saying, No, no, not I don't want that. What about this? And they would come up and they would draw on the board and it sort of encouraged this yeah, everybody mm-hmm. can have a voice in this and explain it. So I love that it just sort of fits in all over the place. And you, and the fact that there's not like a rigid, it sounds to me like there's not a rigid process that you follow necessarily. Probably because it, it, every it's project also is like, unique. Dare I say, it's like reading the room, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't... I'm not a. I'm not wanting to sort of ingratiate myself with, but I, I absolutely love watching comedians because mm-hmm. their their ability to go in with. It's almost like, you know, sort of a martial art. They've got this repertoire of of moves, but they deploy them, at least the best ones, I believe, deploy them in response to how the audience is feeling and responding. Mm -hmm. They're not just like mentally gunning through points one to ten till they finish Mm -hmm. their set. Um, and, Mm. And I feel like that's a little bit like how I've sort of felt sketching and prototyping is, is that you, you go in with a bit of muscle memory and and obviously a degree of preparation that you know what you want to do with this meeting, but, but you're continually trying to sense and read the room 
And if you mm. see someone looking confused, you're like, wait, wait, let's just back up and slow it down. We're going to take it again because I can see you're not happy with it, <laughs> sort of thing, or something didn't connect with you, you know. And I, I and I love that actually, the best of I think your work teaches you that you're you're trying to create rapport and communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the bit that a lot of people probably don't realize that what I do is they see me mess- messing around with technology, but I could be speaking to data scientists. Uh, I could be talking to, you know, fine artists, uh, watchmakers, material scientists, uh, people dealing with mental health, play experts. I mean, I'm just thinking back even just a few months this year, it's been crazy. But it feels like the ability to walk up to a to a whiteboard or a bit of paper and just huddle people around and say, yeah, do we all agree this looks right? Mm-hmm. That That I find one of the most powerful things that seemingly people almost be like was it really that was it really that easy no it <laughs> yeah. was that easy a- and part of you almost feels like you can sense some people are almost like did did we just pay for that and you're just like <laughs> yeah. and and then it then weirdly they sort of dawns on them going yeah but i totally didn't do that did i and we've been here for 6 months and we didn't mm-hmm. we didn't galvanize it <laughs> yeah. so yeah. so i think often that's where designers it's it's a slight blessing and a curse that when you make it look effortless and it just suddenly falls into place, people mm-hmm. are like, well, yeah, of course it's that, isn't it? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, That's funny. That's a funny observation. But, but I mean, I think to your point, as you said, when you've, when you've shown people the process, when they've seen the, the bad sketches... I think actually that's where they do go. Actually, it didn't just fall into place. This wasn't a fluke. Mm -hmm. You've Mm -hmm. done the homework. You've done the preparation. We've all come together and realized that's why it clicked in that meeting. It's, you know, you play it back and you're like, yeah, actually, it was all of that work. All the groundwork counted. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's what, dare I say, I I love. I, I feel that so much of my work is almost like being a detective. Mm. You know, I'm I'm trying not just to understand the the physical stuff. I'm trying to understand all of the the psychology that goes with it, either mm. inside the company or indeed, you know, in the in the market that they're operating in. And I find that's where it just it just never gets dull. Mm. I've not in three in three years. I've not had a dull moment. I really can't think of it. <laughs> mm. Wow. And you know that there's something that crossed my mind here, and I, I I'm I'm in danger of losing it. I'm chasing it with my hand, and it's fading away. But it was something along the lines of you know the psychology of it. So you can have the greatest technology, but if you can't convince people to use the thing, or they have a, some preconceived notion or reaction that that they don't see it, like that great technology won't get used or amplified or made won't be as effective as you hoped it would be. Right. So. I think the psychology is hugely important to mm-hmm. understand, right? So that you, because that could be the barrier, right? Like, you, just because you have the great solution, if someone doesn't want to use it, <laughs> it's going to be really hard to convince them otherwise, you know? Yeah, and I, I think I think often history is written after after the fact, right? So it, it's only when you sort of like really speak to the design teams or you mm. you sort of dig back into the history of things. Like I, I often reference the the iPad that everybody's like, oh yeah, of course, iPad. But but when you you look back at it, that product was like clearly so close from being cut. You know, it was it was financially floundering, the messaging mm-hmm. was off, people writ really sort of cynical reviews of like, what's the point? It's not a mobile yeah. phone, it's not a computer, mm-hmm. why bother? And then you start to see these, you know, you know, and again, people were sort of like, ah, but it's not, you know, Kindle's cheaper and all this sort of stuff. And then when you start seeing the sort of multimedia really fly on it, that sort of stuff is when it's sort of that narrative just got forgotten about. And I think that's mm. what that's what's sort of sometimes so interesting about, I think, the work that I do is you're in this weird space of thinking, I think this is really exciting and has a point. But I also am aware I've got to convince a lot of people that yeah. that that I've uh, I've seen something that they haven't seen inside themselves, or that I've seen something which is going to be really beneficial if they're willing to put the mm. the grind in. And I think I think that is the that's why you keep hearing this storytelling phrase coming up so much. And I know it's a bit of a buzzword, but I think 
you know, sort of hype aside the notion that you just, you know, explain things well and create empathy um, and you show the necessity of a product. I think those things, buzzwords aside, those are pretty universal. I don't think that's ever really, you know, gone in or out of fashion, should we yeah, say. Yeah, been around for a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Well, um, this has been really a fun discussion and fun to hear how you kind of do your work. And um, again, if you are able to find some of the shows that Jude's been, been, been on, you'll see that in action, which is really fun to watch. This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, an infinite canvas sketching app built for tablets with a stylus, like the iPad Pro, Microsoft Surface, and Samsung Galaxy Tab. Concepts' infinite canvas lets you spread out and sketch in any direction. Everything you draw in Concepts is a flexible vector, so you can move your notes around the canvas or change their color, tool, or size with a simple gesture. Search Concepts in your favorite app store for infinite, flexible sketching. So let's shift a little bit. I want to shift sure. now to, to tools that you like to use. Now, typically it's a sketch note around here, and I like to do analog and digital. I've remarked before that the digital tools tend to be really boring. It's an iPad and Procreate, which are great tools. Yep. Like I'm not disparaging them in any way, but... Like it's always the same answer pretty much. So let's start with analog. And because you're you're doing, you know, you're creative technologist, you're doing products, concepting and those and mm. probably more things than I'm even aware of. Feel free to kind of expand beyond just pens and paper. Like uh, are there other things that maybe you can introduce people listening yeah, or watching to? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny because like I even think there's um there's like you can tell the difference between someone who can use a whiteboard and someone who can't. I know that sounds really strange, but even the the sketch behind me, which again, I realize this is on audio, so I won't get too much into it. But what I realized very quickly with, with whiteboards is that as long as you wait like about five seconds, you can go in and just wipe bits off with your finger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and realizing that you can lay down some good uh, construction lines, knowing that you can just pinch them out mm -hmm. or the other one where you draw a box and you think oh, I want it to pop out and it's going to be really cool when it jumps out because it'll give it this dynamic flair like on paper you think oh no, I left the line in I should have should have been mentally prepared to sort of give it space whereas actually in a whiteboard you take it out and it's pristine and mm -hmm. so you can have this strangely really quite high quality visual I think on whiteboards which is mm -hmm. underestimated um, I so I would say like people, you know, getting good at their whiteboard technique is, uh, is an interesting one to sort of be aware of something as simple as you can just pinch it out with your finger. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, also just, um, gosh, what am I thinking? Other things as well. I mean, strangely, I've, my son, just a uh, little boy has just built a little cardboard <laughs> robot here, which, which weirdly is not that much different to what I end up doing. And, and it's just mixed mm -hmm. media. You can see yeah. there's really simple things of just jabbing a hole in and, idea, and pushing yeah. a lollipop stick in. Um, and I think it's just, it, 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 it has a lot of character uh, to it that I understand and, and we understand mm -hmm. as a, as a father, father, son duo, we understand why this little robot um, took shape. And so I think, Sometimes, again, I think as long as you're willing to realize that people will have a bit of a giggle at your first prototype, I often find that's the greatest way to sort of diffuse tension and get everyone mm. to jump in. Mm. So so I would say, strangely, it's not that I deliberately uh, am disingenuous or anything, but I sometimes don't bring my, my best prototyping game on mm. day one. I kind of deliberately leave it a little bit rough and ready because mm -hmm. I want other people to think, oh, oh yeah, I could I could get in on that. That's all yeah. right. That's not too scary. So I think that one and um it's one of those ones that often comes comes to you in the moment, but I think as well using using things that are lying around. Mm. And I realize this is a little bit boring from IDO who are kind of the uh the sort of originals of this or at least really pushed it um as just sometimes realizing that you can build some unusual prototypes with 
nothing more than sellotape and and sometimes found objects in the stationary yeah. cupboard. And I think I think sometimes realizing that you don't have to have a workshop um, to get eighty percent of the idea down. Um, I think I think that's been really powerful, and I've I've definitely been in some meetings where we've just mm. cobbled something together, but but someone who isn't a designer, say someone from marketing, is sort of looking at it with a bit of a grin of going, <laughs> it's ugly, but yes, that is what we were trying to discuss here and yeah. we have a we have a resolution in 20 minutes and mm. okay you guys go now build it properly but they go away happy knowing that the thing is is 80 percent to what they discussed yeah. you got and agreement. i think mm-hmm. i think that's really powerful to be able to get people's agreement and and again your word is is that i mean agreement is such a big part of what you're doing right you're trying to get everyone to say is this can we agree to go forwards you know yeah, agreement agreement and alignment right so agree that this is where we well, yeah. this makes sense and that this is where That's we're accurate. going together yeah yeah so yeah i don't know did that answer the question i guess i'm i'm aware that yes i i use uh procreate <laughs> yeah. in an ipad so <laughs> boring um but yeah i think i think uh and obviously my notebooks uh quite yeah. a bit as well yeah well it, it's really encouraging to hear found objects i think i mentioned to you before we began that my nine-year-old son pounces on objects that look interesting to him and i try yeah. to not discourage him from that because i think he has a lot of fun with it using whiteboards right um having whiteboards to draw on and i spent about three years doing whiteboarding with uh, developers and i got really pretty good at it because i had to i used it mm-hmm. every day and so all those little tricks you talked about like drawing like reversing lines and fixing things and all these little yeah. tricks tricks of the trade that you develop and then you suddenly you know, after two years, you're like doing things like, what are you doing? And then you don't realize that you're doing something, right? It's just what I do. Yeah. Right? So you have to kind of reverse engineer like what what makes sense. So whiteboard markers, and I've got a piece of, uh, they have this roll whiteboard that you can buy at the store now, which has got sticky on the backside, but the front is oh, whiteboard. Yeah. So I just roll it on. I have an old door here in my office, and I just roll it on the door, and then I can do some scribbles, which I've scribbled on there years ago and I haven't changed. So maybe I need to do that again. Yeah. Um, but the materials are pretty inexpensive. Um, and then cardboard, you know, we, there's cardboard everywhere. So is there are there tools for cardboard that you might recommend? Like, um, I oh, think sorry, exacto knives. sorry. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, I, hadn't, I took your tools a little bit abstractly. Uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess there's things like, um, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, we'll put a link in the bottom. I, I've, I did this whole website called Design Modeling, um, mm. which I sort of really wasn't sure whether I was patronizing people by saying, mm. "Here's how to cut a straight line with a ruler." And that, that truth be told, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And and for those of you who already know, then it's like great, you know it. But actually, most people, if you've never been shown, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, it, it's one of those sort of weird things. The amount of times I've had people say, yeah, I was doing it all wrong. Thanks for showing me. I now a get better results and B haven't cut myself in years. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and stuff like that. I feel it's, it's like I, my, my dad was a builder. And so I grew mm. up with sort of carpenters and bricklayers. And I realized that it's not that you can't do something that is close to what you just saw using your eyes but it's that you didn't internalize all the little tiny details and tricks. Mm -hmm. And so there's a reason the brick brick layers wall is really straight and yours won't be on your first attempt. And I kind Mm -hmm. of feel cardboard modeling, a lot of it does come down to um, a bit of muscle memory, Mm -hmm. of course, using things like sharp tools, but strangely, it's a little bit like sketching. There's a point before I attack a given material where I'm sort of almost visualizing what I'm going to do a couple of steps ahead in my mind's mm. eye. And strangely, it's a little, I used to do ceramics for, for some years and it's got a similar thing of where you, you enter this flow state of, mm. of sort of, uh, of almost like being, you know, deliberately taking the, the Mickey now, but it's sort of, you're a bit at one with the cardboard. Mm. And I think what I mean by that is even when I was do, designing this, uh, game goats and llamas, uh, which is a sort of, cardboard DIY game uh, with this guy I uh, got in touch with in Boston, I sort of realized that I was even using the fluting of the, which is the little gaps in between corrugated cardboard. Mm-hmm. I was using that as a, as a means for construction. 
Mm. And I think like you don't see that till you start to develop an affinity for the material. Mm. I think when you just see it as a sort of a sheet of paper that is thick, that isn't really seeing the full potential of yeah. cardboard, if you know what I mean. And yeah. so it takes you a little a little while before you start developing that and you know, weirdly I mentioned the the book by the uh by the chef from from El Bully. And I think it's that thing of like it takes you sometimes years to realise wait a minute, we don't have to do the usual thing with that vegetable or that bit of meat. We mm -hmm. could completely do something new. Mm. Um, so I think, I think whenever you see these like grandmasters of, you know, often from Japan or something and the samurai swords, is th there is this weird point you get to where you hit sort of mastery of a material. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm an artistic master, but I think I've definitely hit mastery of where I... I can make the the material do do whatever I want, <laughs> sort of mm -hmm. within the laws of physics, you know, which is which is kind of weird to think that it's come full circle from what I used to do as a mm -hmm. kid to amuse myself. Mm -hmm. Well, it, is it a little bit like um, working with the material? So, what is the what can it what does it want to do and what does it not want to do? And there's um, probably a, a distance you could push it to where it doesn't want to go, but it's always better to go the way it wants to go, or is that the wrong way to think of it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it's it's funny. I remember when I was doing ceramics, there was, you know, my the, one of the mentors I had later on was like, you start to feel what the pot wants to be. Mm. And that sounds so like Yoda. Yeah. But but because there's the, the point is there's an unpredictability with, with clay on a wheel where it'll have a certain plasticity or tension depending on how it's been stored and all these sorts of things. Whereas with cardboard, there, there just isn't. You don't have this like innate tactile connection with it. But you realize that for me, a, a better analogy is, is more like wood. You know, mm. there is a, a planned attack to it that, you know, wood has a grain. You can You can see whether it's got a particular, you know, strength in a given direction. Um, and again, sort of realizing that, you know, paper has been put together through a series of processes uh, to form the cardboard means mm. you can also disassemble, you can deconstruct. So, you know, one of the techniques I show of how to make a curve out of cardboard is simply just uh, damaging the fluting on one side, mm. which means That's instead of having this sort of, you know, clunky bend where it's just being creased, it's actually creating a nice radii. Mm. So I think stuff like that, you start to just see the potential in, you know, the, 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 the duality of the fact you've got these three layers, which, mm. which actually have quite a lot of variation between them, depending mm. on how you approach it. Yeah, I mean, I, I realize I have a certain amount of uh, <laughs> pigeonholing that I work with cardboard, but <laughs> weirdly, I was, I was speaking to, to um, a journalist uh, um who is sort of uh looking at, I'm just just trying to avoid mentioning the name because I'm like probably shouldn't mention sure. that. Yeah. Um but but a journalist that, and I was describing 3D printing and I sort mm -hmm. of described the the layering as grain and I said well I mm -hmm. I think about it in terms of the orientation is really important to me on how I build objects in CAD knowing that they're going to print in a certain orientation mm -hmm. so I have a a sort of foresight in thinking I want this to come out a certain way. And I think that's a little bit, you know, you see this, I'm sure you do in your work, of you probably mentally envisage how you want to plan the page before you begin laying mm -hmm. it out. And I, I feel that's a little bit how I approach, you know, uh, computer-aided design of, of, of products, but also, as I said, prototyping and sometimes letting mm -hmm. it surprise you where mm -hmm. you put something together and you think, oh, that was a nice accident. Um mm -hmm. There's actually, I've just been doing a little series of videos actually where, uh, again, this might be lost for anyone listening to the audio, but these are the wings of the canary. And I don't know whether ah. you can see that herringbone yeah. pattern. So that, that was an accident of me putting, previously I put a slope on something incorrectly and then realized it creates these steps. Ah. And then later I thought, huh, that'll be really nice as a motif that looks like feathers on the wing. So I, a positive, yeah. Yeah, I, I deliberately induced the, the the wrong thing, which gave the right result. Mm. Um, so I think I think that's um, 
I think that's when you sort of see people who are really comfortable with a with a material or a process or a technique is when you see them playing with things that aren't the the typical mm-hmm. way of using them. Yeah, improvisation, I guess, in many ways, right? Just like yeah, a jazz musician so or something. Back to the comedian thing. That's why yeah. I think I love that that mixture of having a having some tools in the toolkit, but but being comfortable with just rolling with the punches and seeing where mm. it takes you. Sometimes it's fun to take what's just at hand and seeing what you can make of it. Like that's the real challenge and not having yeah. the ideal. I don't have the ideal anything, right? But we can make something of it anyway. Um, a big, I'm a big fan of uh, a designer come architect, uh, Thomas Heatherwick. Um, and there's, there's a really nice sort of preface he has to all the sort of folio stuff of where he takes a piece of clay and he says, what is the most amount of complexity I can give this clay in like one sudden movement and then next to it, it it has what's the most complexity i can give with infinite time so basically he's like mm. gives himself a month and he can keep carving it and sanding it and scratching it and all sorts of stuff and and i love the fact that he he sets himself challenges to just say mm. how can i surprise myself by mm. putting a deliberate constraint Mm-hmm. And I, I feel that I do that a lot to sort of keep to keep work interesting for me and also for the client. I, if a client is wanting originality, I feel like you can't surprise the client if you weren't surprised yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so part of part of being in this little small space is to sort of, you know, be exploring all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. That sounds really great. Hopefully that'll encourage lots of sketch noters to get some cardboard out and play a little bit. I think I've been inspired to get my son and do some cardboard construction with him. He would really he would really I think kids that, kids so. are a great excuse, right? Because yeah. you you suspend your um whatever you want to call it, your filters and your reasons yeah. why it's not quite right. So yeah, I mean I I I I, I knew I was gonna look forward to being a dad, but it's just exceeded my expectations <laughs> <laughs> and well by the way for someone who's listening we'll, we'll i'll make sure and get a link to the um to jude's uh i guess cl- course or class on how to how to do construction um i with, think it, I course think is a little work. ambitious it's more a collection of techniques <laughs> all right that, but, that we'll make sure we get that linked in so you can check yeah. that out i want to check it out myself so let's shift to tips. I kind of warned you that we would we like to give away tips, yes. so something practical. Um, so three tips for someone who's listening, who is uh, probably a visualizer of some sort, but they're maybe fascinated in this idea of uh, prototyping or exploring and playing with things, doing some creation outside of just simply sketching, or maybe it's sketching plus, right? You're sketching on physical objects or something like that. What would be three things you might encourage them with to uh, give it a try. So I guess maybe one of them was sort of borrowing from my friend Tim King, who does the reportage illustration, Mm -hmm. that I think sometimes that that mashup of making your brain engage with something in the environment and then using that as your medium, Mm -hmm. I, I think that's something I don't see done a lot by designers or graphic artists very often. And certainly product designers i i can't even think of anyone who i've seen do that on a regular basis and mm. feel free for people to email me and and tell me i'm wrong because i would love to see that but i i sort of think this notion of sort of being precious about the things in front of you that it really helps sort of like loosen you up mm. so the more likely you are to just get a sharpie and draw over a product or mm-hmm embellish it in some way i think i think will take you to exciting places so i know that's Mm. a bit of a a bit of a quirky tip that i wouldn't say i'm sure most people won't do it on a daily basis but i think it's it's always surprised me when i look at things afresh in the way i engage them not just always saying i'm doing a sketch so it's got to be on paper and i'm Mm -hmm. looking at the thing and i'm sketching i think breaking that as it were, wall and just sketching direct onto something mm-hmm. um, that is related to what you're doing. I think that's mm. that's a pretty exciting one. I guess one of the the tips I sort of wrote down just just casually as you asked me at the beginning was uh, draw for mum. And I know that's a little bit gendered and it's not meant to be sort of uh, patronizing, but I think it's 
for me, that is true because my, my dad is, as I said, ex builder. He's quite comfortable with cutaway drawings and stuff like this. But I, Mm -hmm. I think it's more draw for someone who, you know, isn't in your world Mm. of, of thinking and setup and appropriation of tools or, or things like this. So, so having someone in mind who you think I have to really explain it on their terms with no prior mm. knowledge, I think challenging yourself to do that regularly um, is a is just a really good way to sort of build empathy as well. So I'd say those 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 two were sort of uh, should we say intellectually and creatively serious. I guess I I thought I'd just end with a slightly <laughs> flippant one. Um because it's a it's a good story and it usually gets a chuckle from uh people I've mentioned it. I, I I probably will get you know, it's it's I should probably just sort of make it sound like it's a it's apocryphal, but um when I was at Dyson, uh I, and and I should say I've never had James Di- Sir James Dyson confirm or disconfirm this but I was told maybe as a wind up I don't know by one of the engineers that said so when you're sitting opposite it's a good idea if you learn to sketch upside down Mm. because it's annoying if you keep having to draw from your perspective because Sir James doesn't particularly appreciate then having to spin your paper around and then backwards forwards backwards Mm. forwards backwards forwards so as I said I'm being I'm trying to be like fair to James Dyson to say I never got confirmation that he did or didn't <laughs> like that but I, I it was one of those things where as I said even if even if I was to give that advice to a junior I've sort of actually gone like you know what don't worry about the person or the setup it's actually a really good skill to learn mm-hmm. because a it 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 forces you to be able to flip something in your head and genuinely, when you're in a, a meeting, and I've, I've, I've been in some meetings with people where you're just like, you feel like a total imposter. It's such a cool icebreaker just to be able yeah. to do that. And people are like, wait, and you can see it in their face where they're like, oh my God, he's just drawn it from my perspective. And, and it's kind of quite, you know, it just instantly disarms people because it's mm. almost like a, it's almost like such a generous thing to do for someone who you don't yeah. know. To just be like, I'm instantly putting myself at your disposal, mm. even down to the fact I will draw upside down for you mm. at, at speed. Mm. Um, so I think I think that, for me, irrespective of whether people think it's a little bit like, oh, you know, James Dyson this, James Dyson that, I think don't don't get, you know, don't don't let the uh, the truth get in the way of a good story, as they yeah. say. <laughs> so, That's good. A good principle, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just I just think for me, I, I've never it's it's almost like a good magic trick. You like sometimes I don't want to know the truth because the what what that little thing that that person told me, uh whether it was a joke or not, I think it really set me on a good course for sort of empathy mm. and and just being willing to go the extra mile in a meeting, mm. um, so I think irrespective of its validity, it's a <laughs> the truth okay. of that. Uh, I just think it's a great a great thing to try and deploy. Um, mm. That's a great that's a great suggestion. You're just turning it in their direction. I think you're right. It sort of helps you think of it in more dimensions than just your own, right? So you're yeah. maybe you'll see something by actually drawing it in their perspective that you wouldn't have seen had you drawn in yours. Mm. Um, mm. I had a friend. I have a friend, James Carlson. His his big thing was always learn how to draw while you're speaking. So speaking and drawing at the same time. He was really good at it. So he could be yeah. drawing and explaining himself and continue drawing. I've not I've not achieved his level of success, but I've. So if you could imagine like mixing those two. So if you could draw upside down, so mm. that you're you're drawing for the other person and you're able to talk at the same time. So you're sort of explaining what you're doing as you're doing it. That could be a really fun experience for the receiver you know i hadn't i hadn't actually realized that that yeah basically within that was the ability it was just assumed that you could talk through it as well yeah i think maybe this is a useful tip for you but again the person was kind enough to point out to me that it's like they were like if you can't do it straight off the bat that's why you need to practice it Mm -hmm. so we we would always go into meetings knowing that we wanted to present the whatever and so I would be there, you know, sort of 10 minutes before going, okay, so I'm going to say this, mm. I'm going to do that, mm-hmm. and I'm going to say this. And and so I would say the only, the only, it's a little bit fake it till you can make it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to practice. Usually with clients, you're not, they're not sitting there going, draw a banana in a Ferrari. 
<laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, panic. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, you're going to do a sketch of the thing that yeah. you've been working on for the past six months. So I'm saying, weirdly, it's, it's, it's more just a little bit of a dress rehearsal and then mm-hmm. you get to look super impressive. Mm-hmm. I suppose if you have kids like we have, like, uh, the way to, to test yourself is to show it to your kids, right? Explain something yeah. to them and then use this upside down drawing trick and see how they react to it. And then maybe that's the way you present ideas to them. So that's, this is your practice, right? You could run it past them on low stakes, you know, your kids will laugh yeah. at you and you can see before you go and before Sir James, right? And, and make a fool of yourself <laughs> or something. <laughs> But, but yeah, story. weirdly, I think it's also like that that thing of your kids, as I said, uh, are really not particularly critical. Um, yeah. But I think I think the thing I've noticed is that even when you get it wrong, people are still just amazed that it's even eighty percent right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they're they're it's it's such a party trick that you sort yeah. of actually sometimes you just forget that you're even doing the trick. Mm-hmm. You know. So um, yeah, I would say that weirdly, the the only other thing to mention is uh, I'm. I'm dyslexic myself and I know that mm. there is usually a bit of an ability to flip things because you're doing that anyway Naturally, with words. Yeah. Mm. So um yeah, I'd say if anyone listening or watching this is is dyslexic then probably you'll find it's not actually that difficult to pick it up. Mm. Um mm. so it's a fringe benefit to <laughs> the, <laughs> the otherwise the problem. <laughs> <laughs> superpower. Hidden superpower. Yeah. Well, that's really great. You're challenging me, challenging me to practice this now, Jude. So thank you for encouraging me with the last tip, especially, but I love the others as well. That's it. So cool. People obviously now have heard your story and what you do and the way you think, and they want to learn more about you. How? What's the best way to, to reach you? Is it uh, websites, social media, YouTube, something like What are the best places to find you? Yeah, I don't know. It sounds, sounds weird, but I'd almost say like Google. <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> I realized a bit of, I, I mean, to my embarrassment, my personal website, com, you can obviously find my email and you can reach me. But I love a bit of advice from, you know, a friend of mine, David Over, uh, when we worked at Sugru, literally years and years ago, his his opinion was that the sort of home website was going to sort of dissolve into you existing and curating things mm-hmm. on different platforms. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel... You know, if if you're interested in what I get up to, you know, making things in nature with my son, then Instagram and Board Smart. If you're looking for uh, essentially me humble bragging through what I've been doing, then of course LinkedIn and Twitter is usually the place yeah. you'd find it. But but yeah, I think YouTube is the more, you know, that's where I've done talks or presentations, mm. and mm. and that's usually where I sort of feel probably. It's the least BS stuff. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's me trying to be help. You know, th- this phrase I often apply to my work is, is, is it helpful? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, I, I would like to think that's the sincere effort of a lot of my stuff on YouTube is it's trying to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Yes, of course, there's a little bit of salesmanship and all that sort of stuff, but it's, I wouldn't put something out there if I didn't think it was helpful to someone. Yeah. And, you know, the thing I think about YouTube is you've got a great series of interviews with inter- really interesting people, which is, you know, I did an interview with you not realizing it. And then like, oh, there's this whole collection. And I started watching them, all of them. And they're all really fun and interesting people. So <laughs> that would be a good reason to go to YouTube if that's where you want to enter in. But we'll find, of course, you know, as we always do. We, we'll put some we, stuff in the description. Yep. Yeah, well, we do the descriptions <laughs> and show notes. We I'm kind of fanatical about that. I do them myself. I don't farm it out. I do it all myself and because I want to make sure I capture the stuff. So we yeah. will put that in there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jude, this has been just such a joy to chat with you and get to know you a little better. And thanks so yeah. much for being on the show. It's really fun. No, it's a pleasure. And uh, thanks for everyone for getting this far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep in touch. Well, for everyone who's listening or watching, this is another episode of the podcast. Uh, until next time, we'll talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code Rohde40 for 40% off. 
Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.